The Adventure of the Sinister Stranger The Adventure of the Sinister Stranger was first published in the sketch, October 22, 1924. The brothers Desmond and Major Okud were created by Valentine Williams, 1183, 1946, writing as Douglas Valentine. It's been a darn dull day, said Tommy, and yawned widely. Nearly tea time, said Tuppence and also yawned. Business was not brisk in the International Detective Agency. The eagerly expected letter from the ham merchant had not arrived and bona fide cases were not forthcoming. Albert, the office boy, entered with a sealed package which he laid on the table. The mystery of the sealed packet, murmured Tommy. Did it contain the fabulous pearls of the Russian Grand Duchess? Or was it an infernal machine destined to blow Blunt's brilliant detectives to pieces? As a matter of fact, said Tuppence, tearing open the package. It's my wedding present to Francis Haviland. Rather nice, isn't it? Tommy took a slender silver cigarette case from her outstretched hand, noted the inscription engraved in her own handwriting, Francis from Tuppence, opened and shut the case, and nodded approvingly. You do throw your money about, Tuppence, he remarked. I'll have one like it, only in gold, for my birthday next month. Fancy wasting a thing like that on Francis Haviland who always was and always will be one of the most perfect asses God ever made. You forget I used to drive him about during the war, when he was a general. Ah! Those were the good old days. They were, agreed Tommy. Beautiful women used to come and squeeze my hand in hospital, I remember. But I don't send them all wedding presents. I don't believe the bride will care much for this gift of yours. Tuppence. It's nice and slim for the pocket, isn't it? said Tuppence, disregarding his remarks. Tommy slipped it into his own pocket. Just right, he said approvingly. Hello, here is Albert with the afternoon post. Very possibly the Duchess of Perthshire is commissioning us to find her prize peak. They sorted through the letters together. Suddenly Tommy gave vent to a prolonged whistle and held up one of them in his hand. A blue letter with a Russian stamp on it. Do you remember what the chief said? We were to look out for letters like that. How exciting, said Tuppence. Something has happened at last. Open it and see if the contents are up to schedule. A ham merchant, wasn't it? Half a minute. We shall want some milk for tea. They forgot to leave it this morning. I'll send Albert out for it. She returned from the outer office, after dispatching Albert on his errand, to find Tommy holding the blue sheet of paper in his hand. As we thought, Tuppence, he remarked. Almost word for word what the chief said. Tuppence took the letter from him and read it. It was couched in careful stilted English and purported to be from one Gregor Fyodorsky, who was anxious for news of his wife. The International Detective Agency was urged to spare no expense in doing their utmost to trace her. Fyodorsky himself was unable to leave Russia at the moment owing to a crisis in the pork trade. I wonder what it really means, said Tuppence thoughtfully, smoothing out the sheet on the table in front of her. Code of some kind, I suppose, said Tommy. That's not our business. Our business is to hand it over to the chief as soon as possible. Better just verify it by soaking off the stamp and seeing if the number 16 is underneath. All right, said Tuppence. But I should think. She stopped dead, and Tommy, surprised by her sudden pause, looked up to see a man's burly figure blocking the doorway. The intruder was a man of commanding presence, squarely built, with a very round head and a powerful jaw. He might have been about forty-five years of age. I must beg your pardon, said the stranger, advancing into the room, hat in hand. I found your outer office empty and this door open, so I venture to intrude. This is Blunt's International Detective Agency, 
is it not? Certainly it is. And you are, perhaps, Mr. Blunt? Mr. Theodore Blunt. I am Mr. Blunt. You wish to consult me? This is my secretary, Miss Robinson. Tuppence inclined her head gracefully, but continued to scrutinize the stranger narrowly through her downcast eyelashes. She was wondering how long he had been standing in the doorway, and how much he had seen and heard. It did not escape her observation that even while he was talking to Tommy, his eyes kept coming back to the blue paper in her hand. Tommy's voice, sharp with a warning note, recalled her to the needs of the moment. Miss Robinson, please, take notes. Now, sir, will you kindly state the matter on which you wish to have my advice? Tuppence reached for her pad and pencil. The big man began in rather a harsh voice. My name is Bower. Dr. Charles Bower. I live in Hampstead, where I have a practice. I have come to you, Mr. Blunt, because several rather strange occurrences have happened lately. Yes, Dr. Bower. Twice in the course of the last week I have been summoned by telephone to an urgent case, in each case to find that the summons has been a fake. The first time I thought a practical joke had been played upon me, but on my return the second time I found that some of my private papers had been displaced and disarranged, and now I believe that the same thing had happened the first time. I made an exhaustive search and came to the conclusion that my whole desk had been thoroughly ransacked, and the various papers replaced hurriedly. Dr. Bauer paused and gazed at Tommy. Well, Mr. Blunt. Well, Dr. Bauer, replied the young man, smiling. What do you think of it, eh? Well, first I should like the facts. What do you keep in your desk? My private papers. Exactly. Now, what do those private papers consist of? What value are they to the common thief, or any particular person? To the common thief I cannot see that they would have any value at all, but my notes on certain obscure alkaloids would be of interest to anyone possessed of technical knowledge of the subject. I have been making a study of such matters for the last few years. These alkaloids are deadly and virulent poisons, and are in addition, almost untraceable. They yield no known reactions. The secret of them would be worth money, then. To unscrupulous persons, yes. And you suspect, who? The doctor shrugged his massive shoulders. As far as I can tell, the house was not entered forcibly from the outside. That seems to point to some member of my household, and yet I cannot believe he broke off abruptly, then began again, his voice very grave. Mr. Blunt, I must place myself in your hands unreservedly. I dare not go to the police in the matter. Of my three servants I am almost entirely sure. They have served me long and faithfully. Still, one never knows. Then I have living with me my two nephews, Bertram and Henry. Henry is a good boy, a very good boy, he has never caused me any anxiety, an excellent hard-working young fellow. Bertram, I regret to say, is of quite a different character, wild, extravagant, and persistently idle. I see, said Tommy thoughtfully. You suspect your nephew Bertram of being mixed up in this business. Now I don't agree with you. I suspect the good boy, Henry. But why? Tradition. Precedent. Tommy waved his hand airily. In my experience, the suspicious characters are always innocent, and vice versa, my dear sir. Yes, decidedly, I suspect Henry. Excuse me, Mr. Blunt, said Tuppence, interrupting in a deferential tone. Did I understand Dr. Bauer to say that these notes on, ER, obscure alkaloids, are kept in the desk with the other papers? They are kept in the desk, my dear young lady but in a secret drawer, the position of which is known only to myself. 
Hence they have so far defied the search. And what exactly do you want me to do, Dr. Bauer? asked Tommy. Do you anticipate that a further search will be made? I do, Mr. Blunt. I have every reason to believe so. This afternoon I received a telegram from a patient of mine whom I ordered to Bournemouth a few weeks ago. The telegram states that my patient is in a critical condition, and begs me to come down at once. Rendered suspicious by the events I have told you of, I myself dispatched a telegram, prepaid, to the patient in question, and elicited the fact that he was in good health and had sent no summons to me of any kind. It occurred to me that if I pretended to have been taken in, and duly departed to Bournemouth, we should have a very good chance of finding the miscreants at work. They, or he, will doubtless wait until the household has retired to bed before commencing operations. I suggest that you should meet me outside my house at 11 o'clock this evening, and we will investigate the matter together. Hoping, in fact, to catch them in the act. Tommy drummed thoughtfully on the table with a paper knife. Your plan seems to me an excellent one, Dr. Bauer. I cannot see any hitch in it. Let me see, your address is. The Larch is, Hammond's Lane, rather a lonely part, I am afraid. But we command magnificent views over the heath. Quite so, said Tommy. The visitor rose. Then I shall expect you tonight, Mr. Blunt. Outside the larches at, shall we say, five minutes to eleven, to be on the safe side. Certainly. Five minutes to eleven. Good afternoon, Dr. Bauer. Tommy rose, pressed a buzzer on his desk, and Albert appeared to show the client out. The doctor walked with a decided limp but his powerful physique was evident in spite of it. An ugly customer to tackle, murmured Tommy to himself. Well, Tuppence, old girl, what do you think of it? I'll tell you in one word, said Tuppence. Clubfoot. What? I said clubfoot. My study of the classics has not been in vain. Tommy, this thing's a plant. Obscure alkaloids indeed, I never heard a weaker story. Even I did not find it very convincing, admitted her husband. Did you see his eyes on the letter? Tommy, he's one of the gang. They've got wise to the fact that you're not the real Mr. Blunt, and they're out for our blood. In that case, said Tommy, opening the side cupboard and surveying his rows of books with an affectionate eye. Our role is easy to select. We are the brothers Oakwood. And I am Desmond, he added firmly. Tuppence shrugged her shoulders. All right. Have it your own way. I'd as soon be Francis. Francis was much the more intelligent of the two. Desmond always gets into a mess, and Francis turns up as the gardener or something in the nick of time and saves the situation. Ah, said Tommy, but I shall be a super Desmond. When I arrive at the larches. Tuppence interrupted him unceremoniously. You're not going to Hampstead tonight. Why not? Walk into a trap with your eyes shut. No, my dear girl, walk into a trap with my eyes open. There's a lot of difference. I think our friend, Dr. Bauer, will get a little surprise. I don't like it, said Tuppence. You know what happens when Desmond disobeys the chief's orders and acts on his own. Our orders were quite clear. To send on the letters at once and to report immediately on anything that happened. You've not got it quite right, said Tommy. We were to report immediately if anyone came in and mentioned the number 16. Nobody has. That's a quibble, said Tuppence. It's no good. I've got a fancy for playing a lone hand. My dear old Tuppence, I shall be all right. I shall go armed to the teeth. The essence of the whole thing is that I shall be on my guard and they won't know it. The chief will be patting me on the back for a good night's work. 
Well, said Tuppence. I don't like it. That man's as strong as a gorilla. Ah, said Tommy, but think of my blue-nosed automatic. The door of the outer office opened and Albert appeared. Closing the door behind him, he approached them with an envelope in his hand. A gentleman to see you, said Albert. When I began the usual stunt of saying you were engaged with Scotland Yard, he told me he knew all about that. Said he came from Scotland Yard himself. And he wrote something on a card and stuck it up in this envelope. Tommy took the envelope and opened it. As he read the card, a grin passed across his face. The gentleman was amusing himself at your expense by speaking the truth, Albert, he remarked. Show him in. He tossed the card to Tuppence. It bore the name Detective Inspector Dim Hirsch, and across it was scrawled in pencil, a friend of Marriott's. In another minute the Scotland Yard detective was entering the inner office. In appearance, Inspector Dim Hirsch was of the same type as Inspector Marriott, short and thick set, with shrewd eyes. Good afternoon, said the detective breezily. Marriott's away in South Wales, but before he went he asked me to keep an eye on you too, and on this place in general. Oh, bless you, sir, he went on, as Tommy seemed about to interrupt him, we know all about it. It's not our department and we don't interfere. But somebody's got wise lately to the fact that all is not what it seems. You've had a gentleman here this afternoon. I don't know what he called himself, and I don't know what his real name is, but I know just a little about him. Enough to want to know more. Am I right in assuming that he made a date with you for some particular spot this evening? Quite right. I thought as much 16, Westerham Road, Finsbury Park, was that it? You're wrong there, said Tommy with a smile. Dead wrong. The larches, Hampstead. Dim Hirsch seemed honestly taken aback. Clearly he had not expected this. I don't understand it, he muttered. It must be a new layout. The larches, Hampstead, you said. Yes. I'm to meet him there at eleven o'clock tonight. Don't you do it, sir? There, burst from Tuppence. Tommy flushed. If you think, Inspector, he began heatedly. But the Inspector raised a soothing hand. I'll tell you what I think, Mr. Blunt. The place you want to be at eleven o'clock tonight is here in this office. What? cried Tuppence, astonished. Here in this office. Never mind how I know, departments overlap sometimes, but you got one of those famous blue letters today. Old Watts his name is after that. He lures you up to Hampstead, makes quite sure of your being out of the way, and steps in here at night when all the building is empty and quiet to have a good search round at his leisure. But why should he think the letter would be here? He'd know I should have it on me or else have passed it on. Begging your pardon, sir, that's just what he wouldn't know. He may have tumbled to the fact that you're not the original Mr. Blunt, but he probably thinks that you're a bona fide gentleman who's bought the business. In that case, the letter would be all in the way of regular business and would be filed as such. I see, said Tuppence. And that's just what we've got to let him think. We'll catch him red-handed here tonight. So that's the plan, is it? Yes. It's the chance of a lifetime. Now, let me see, what's the time? Six o'clock. What time do you usually leave here, sir? About six. You must seem to leave the place as usual. Actually we'll sneak back to it as soon as possible. I don't believe they'll come here till about eleven, but of course they might. If you'll excuse me. I'll just go and take a look round outside and see if I can make out anyone watching the place. Dim Hirsch departed, and Tommy began an argument with Tuppence. It lasted some time and was heated and acrimonious. 
In the end Tuppence suddenly capitulated. All right, she said. I give in. I'll go home and sit there like a good little girl whilst you tackle crooks and hobnob with detectives, but you wait, young man. I'll be even with you yet for keeping me out of the fun. Dim Hertz returned at that moment. Coast seems clear enough, he said. But you can tell. Better seem to leave in the usual manner. They won't go on watching the place once you've gone. Tommy called Albert and gave him instructions to lock up. Then the four of them made their way to the garage nearby where the car was usually left. Tuppence drove and Albert sat beside her. Tommy and the detective sat behind. Presently they were held up by a block in the traffic. Tuppence looked over her shoulder and nodded. Tommy and the detective opened the right-hand door and stepped out into the middle of Oxford Street. In a minute or two Tuppence drove on. Better not go in just yet, said Dim Hirsch as he and Tommy hurried into Haleham Street. You've got the key all right. Tommy nodded. Then what about a bite of dinner? It's early, but there's a little place here right opposite. We'll get a table by the window, so that we can watch the place all the time. They had a very welcome little meal in the manner the detective had suggested. Tommy found Inspector Dim Hirsch quite an entertaining companion. Most of his official work had lain amongst international spies, and he had tales to tell which astonished his simple listener. They remained in the little restaurant until 8 o'clock, when Dim Hirsch suggested a move. It's quite dark now, sir, he explained. We shall be able to slip in without anyone being the wiser, it was, as he said, quite dark. They crossed the road, looked quickly up and down a deserted street, and slipped inside the entrance. Then they mounted the stairs, and Tommy inserted his key in the lock of the outer office. Just as he did so, he heard, as he thought, Dim Hirsch whistle beside him. What are you whistling for? he asked sharply. I didn't whistle said Dim Hirsch, very much astonished. I thought you did. Well, someone began Tommy. He got no further. Strong arms seized him from behind, and before he could cry out, a pad of something sweet and sickly was pressed over his mouth and nose. He struggled valiantly, but in vain. The chloroform did its work. His head began to whirl and the floor heaved up and down in front of him. Choking, he lost consciousness. He came to himself painfully, but in full possession of his faculties. The chloroform had been only a whiff. They had kept him under long enough to force a gag into his mouth and ensure that he did not cry out. When he came to himself, he was half lying, half sitting propped against the wall in a corner of his own inner office. Two men were busily turning out the contents of the desk and ransacking the cupboards, and as they worked they cursed freely. Swelp me, G.U.V. Nor, said the taller of the two hoarsely, we've turned the whole B.Y. place upside down and inside out. It's not there. It must be here, snarled the other. It isn't on him. And there's no other place it can be. As he spoke he turned, and to Tommy's utter amazement he saw that the last speaker was none other than Inspector Dim Hirsch. The latter grinned when he saw Tommy's astonished face. So our young friend is awake again, he said. And a little surprised, yes, a little surprised. But it was so simple. We suspect that all is not as it should be with the International Detective Agency. I volunteer to find out if that is so, or not. If the new Mr. Blunt is indeed a spy, he will be suspicious, so I sent first my dear old friend, Carl Bauer. Carl is told to act suspiciously and pitch an improbable tale. He does so, and then I appear on the scene. I used the name of Inspector Marriott to gain confidence. The rest is easy. He laughed. Tommy was dying to say several things, but the gag in his mouth prevented him. 
Also, he was dying to do several things, mostly with his hands and feet, but alas, that too had been attended to. He was securely bound. The thing that amazed him most was the astounding change in the man standing over him. As Inspector Dim Hirsch the fellow had been a typical Englishman. Now, no one could have mistaken him for a moment for anything but a well-educated foreigner who talked English perfectly without a trace of accent. Coggins, my good friend, said the erstwhile inspector, addressing his ruffianly-looking associate, take your life preserver and stand by the prisoner. I am going to remove the gag. You understand, my dear Mr. Blunt, do you not, that it would be criminally foolish on your part to cry out? But I am sure you do. For your age, you are quite an intelligent lad. Very deftly he removed the gag and stepped back. Tommy eased his stiff jaws, rolled his tongue round his mouth, swallowed twice, and said nothing at all. I congratulate you on your restraint, said the other. You appreciate the position, I see. Have you nothing at all to say? What I have to say will keep, said Tommy. And it won't spoil by waiting. Ah! What I have to say will not keep. In plain English, Mr. Blunt, where is that letter? My dear fellow, I don't know, said Tommy cheerfully. I haven't got it. But you know that as well as I do. I should go on looking about if I were you. I like to see you and Frank Coggins playing hide and seek together. The other's face darkened. You are pleased to be flippant, Mr. Blunt. You see that square box over there? That is Coggins's little outfit. In it there is vitriol, yes, vitriol, and irons that can be heated in the fire, so that they are red hot and burn. Tommy shook his head sadly. An error in diagnosis, he murmured. Tuppence and I labeled this adventure wrong. It's not a clubfoot story. It's a bulldog drummond, and you are the inimitable Carl Peterson. What is this nonsense you are talking, snarled the other. Ah, said Tommy. I see you are unacquainted with the classics. A pity. Ignorant fool. Will you do what we want or will you not? Shall I tell Coggins to get out his tools and begin? Don't be so impatient, said Tommy. Of course I'll do what you want, as soon as you tell me what it is. You don't suppose I want to be carved up like a filleted sole and fried on a gridiron? I loathe being hurt. Dim Hirsch looked at him in contempt. God! What cowards are these English? Common sense, my dear fellow, merely common sense. Leave the vitriol alone and let us come down to brass tacks. I want the letter. I've already told you I haven't got it. We know that, we also know who must have it. The girl. Very possibly you're right, said Tommy. She may have slipped it into her handbag when your pal Carl startled us. Oh, you do not deny. That is wise. Very good, you will write to this tuppence, as you call her, bidding her bring the letter here immediately. I can do that, began Tommy. The other cut in before he had finished the sentence. Ah! You can't? Well, we shall soon see. Coggins. Don't be in such a hurry, said Tommy. And do wait for the end of the sentence. I was going to say that I can't do that unless you untie my arms. Hang it all, I'm not one of those freaks who can write with their noses or their elbows. You are willing to write, then? Of course. Haven't I been telling you so all along? I'm all out to be pleasant and obliging. You won't do anything unkind to Tuppence, of course. I'm sure you won't. She's such a nice girl. We only want the letter, said Dim Hirsch, but there was a singularly unpleasant smile on his face. At a nod from him the brutal Coggins knelt down and unfastened Tommy's arms. 
The latter swung them to and fro. That's better, he said cheerfully. Will kind Coggins hand me my fountain pen? It's on the table, I think, with my other miscellaneous property. Scowling, the man brought it to him, and provided a sheet of paper. Be careful what you say, Dim Hirsch said menacingly. We leave it to you, but failure means death, and slow death at that. In that case, said Tommy, I will certainly do my best. He reflected a minute or two, then began to scribble rapidly. How will this do, he asked, handing over the completed epistle. Dear Tuppence, can you come along at once and bring that blue letter with you? We want to decode it here and now. In haste? Francis? Francis? queried the bogus inspector, with lifted eyebrows. Was that the name she called you? As you weren't at my christening, said Tommy, I don't suppose you can know whether it's my name or not. But I think the cigarette case you took from my pocket is a pretty good proof that I'm speaking the truth. The other stepped over to the table and took up the case, read Francis from Tuppence with a faint grin and laid it down again. I am glad to find you are behaving so sensibly, he said. Coggins, give that note to Vasily. He is on guard outside. Tell him to take it at once. The next twenty minutes passed slowly, the ten minutes after that more slowly still. Dim Hirsch was striding up and down with a face that grew darker and darker. Once he turned menacingly on Tommy. If you have dared to double-cross us, he growled. If we'd had a pack of cards here, we might have had a game of piquet to pass the time, drawled Tommy. Women always keep one waiting. I hope you're not going to be unkind to little Tuppence when she comes. Oh, no, said Dim Hirsch. We shall arrange for you to go to the same place, together. Will you, you swine, said Tommy under his breath. Suddenly there was a stir in the outer office. A man whom Tommy had not yet seen poked his head in and growled something in Russian. Good, said Dim Hirsch. She is coming, and coming alone. For a moment a faint anxiety caught at Tommy's heart. The next minute he heard Tuppence's voice. Oh, there you are, Inspector Dim Hirsch. I've brought the letter. Where is Francis? With the last words she came through the door, and Vasily sprang on her from behind, clapping his hand over her mouth. Dim Hirsch tore the handbag from her grasp and turned over its contents in a frenzied search. Suddenly he uttered an ejaculation of delight and held up a blue envelope with a Russian stamp on it. Coggins gave a hoarse shout. And just in that minute of triumph the other door, the door into Tuppence's own office, Opened noiselessly and Inspector Marriott and two men armed with revolvers stepped into the room, with a sharp command, hands up. There was no fight. The others were taken at a hopeless disadvantage. Dim Hirsch's automatic lay on the table, and the two others were not armed. A very nice little hall, said Inspector Marriott with approval, as he snapped the last pair of handcuffs. And we'll have more as time goes on. I hope. White with rage, Dim Hirsch glared at Tuppence. You little devil, he snarled. It was you put them on to us. Tuppence laughed. It wasn't all my doing. I ought to have guessed, I admit, when you brought in a number 16 this afternoon. But it was Tommy's note clinched matters. I rang up Inspector Marriott got Albert to meet him with a duplicate key of the office, and came along myself with the empty blue envelope in my bag. The letter I forwarded according to my instructions as soon as I had parted with you two this afternoon. But one word had caught the other's attention. Tommy, he queried. Tommy, who had just been released from his bonds, came towards them. Well done, Brother Francis, he said to Tuppence taking both her hands in his. And to Dim Hirsch, as I told you, my dear fellow, 
You really ought to read the classics. The end.